Happy good Sunday to you, wherever you may be. I am Mitch Friedman, and one week following the 2019 Bilderberg Conference, I am still in Switzerland. At the moment, I'm coming to you from the beautiful city of Lucerne, no longer in the French-speaking area, now in the Swiss-German-speaking area. And one week following 29 the 2019 Bilderberg Conference, I am still discussing Bilderberg. I think this year's conference, albeit maybe not that noteworthy in the the long line of Bilderberg conferences that have taken place, for me it's it's been quite noteworthy and a quite a, a busy conference and there's been a lot to unpack since the conference ended one week ago and that has a lot to do with some revelations that I discovered in the Turkish language BBC this week, which I'm going to delve into just momentarily. But first, as I kick this broadcast off, I see I'm joined by a few people, possibly more. I'd like to say thank you very much for joining me. I don't typically, at least in the past, I've not typically done live streams on YouTube, but I'm trying to start to make a practice of that. I began back in uh, Ukraine a month or so ago when I was covering the election there, and we'll see how this goes. So please, if you do have any comments and questions, I'm, I see I am getting some chat, so uh, Liberty Cat saying hi Josh, uh, hi Liberty Cat. Yeah, please, if you've got any comments and questions, please leave them in this chat on the stream and I'll do my best to address them. I want to hopefully have some interaction and not just have me rambling and if if you want to go in one direction or another with regard to Bilderberg and some related matters of discussion, why not? Let's go there. Over the course of this broadcast, I'm going to recap the conference a little bit as I've already alluded to. I'm going to be focusing in on some revelations about what was discussed at Bilderberg 2019, and I'm also going to be previewing some of my upcoming travels, which could have some connection to what I'm discussing right now and what was discussed at the conference. So I'm guessing if you're joining me right now, you're already familiar with Bilderberg. I probably don't have to explain to you what the Bilderberg group is and what the Bilder what Bilderberg conferences are. If by by whatever chance you are not at all familiar with Bilderberg and you just happen to randomly be tuning in right now, please check out the recent videos on my channel. I think there are about 10 from this year's Bilderberg and in the first video that uh, I don't remember what I titled it. I'll try to pull it up It it was something like uh, Bilderberg 2019 begins reporting from majestic Montreux, Switzerland If you have a watch at that video, I do give you some brief explanation as to what the Bilderberg group and conference are as well as that was a preview of this year's event and over the course of the few days last week that the Bilderberg conference took place, I did have some interactions with participants. They were a bit limited in most cases, but you can find those interviews, confrontations, whatever you want to call it, up on my channel as well. All the recent videos are from Bilderberg. But now, getting to the news, what, what happens often with these Bilderberg conferences, I've covered a few of them now, is that there's a lot of excitement both from the audience tuning in and from the limited press corps that's there on the ground outside. A lot of excitement at the, the onset of the conference and over the few days in which it takes place, and then for maybe the Monday or Tuesday after the conference ends, there there's still uh, definite interest, but over the course of the week following Bilderberg, that interest dies down, and obviously for weeks and months thereafter, the, the interest really dies down. But what sometimes occurs, which was certainly the case last year with news breaking that the Daily Mail had succeeded in infiltrating Bilderberg, uh, thank you very much for the comments, people chiming in, uh, one person saying wonderful reporting on Bilderberg. Thank you very much. So, so what happens sometimes is that 
over the course of the week following Bilderberg, or maybe just a couple days, some serious news breaks about what happened during the conference, but often the interest level online and offline has died down and this major news can get glossed over. So last year it came out about a week following the conference that the Daily Mail did succeed in getting an investigative reporter embedded in the hotel staff and out of that they've got some pretty impressive photos and some video footage about what's going on. I've talked a little bit about that this year and obviously you can go to the Daily Mail and, and find their investigative report from last year. Well, what happened a couple days following the conference this year is there's one participant, a Turkish academic and economist, her name is Selva Demiralp, and Ms. Demiralp published in the Turkish language BBC an article in which she basically details important discussions that took place at this year's Bilderberg conference. And my guess is that almost no one saw it. It was only in the, the Turkish language BBC, although I did get in touch with Ms. Demiralp and she said that it was going to go up, the English language was going to uh, Links? Uh, yes, I should have thrown in a uh, link to that. <laughs> Let me see if I, if I can. I'm not sure if I can. But I'll, I'll tell you right now, with regard to this report, I have an English language copy in front of me. I don't believe it's online. It might be. But what you can do is you can go to the website bulgariaanalytica.org. That is just the word Bulgaria. Analytica, like Cambridge Analytica, but not Cambridge Analytica, BulgariaAnalytica.org. And if you go to that website, the report or article that is front and center is an article of mine that I wrote a couple days ago discussing and detailing Ms. Demiralp's account of the Bilderberg conference. I'll try to get in a link to this article in the YouTube live comments or the, the live stream chat. Sorry, I'm, I'm not so familiar with this. I don't do this often and I don't want to mess it up. So that's why I'm just t telling you that if you go to bulgariaanalytica.org and you pull up my article, which is titled, what is it titled? It is titled Surprise Bilderberg Report reveals divided Western elites united against Turkey S-400 deal. So you can go to bulgariaanalytica.org and pull up my article, and my article details basically what uh, Ms. Demiralp said about the conference, and it includes some important quotes, one of which is about the future of the EU, and some serious concerns that were apparently raised uh, uh, at the Bilderberg conference this year with regard to what might happen if a new economic crisis in Europe were to unfold. And I've got a quote in there in the article, and I'm also, because Ms. Demiralp was so kind, and I did get in touch with her, she sent me the English version that she wrote of her article and this quote I found to be striking. I mentioned it in the Bulgarian analytical report and here it is in front of me. She has a section of her BBC Turkish article translated, which the whole thing is translated to English. I have it in front of me. This section is subheaded, if Europe has a crisis, question mark. And she goes on to discuss that um, she's talking about various issues within the EU, but then she delves specifically into what if there's a new economic crisis in Europe, and I found this striking. So here it is verbatim. Ms. Demiralp writing with regard to what people were discussing about at Bilderberg this year. Quote, but if the European economy slows down and comes to the verge of a new crisis, are there enough tools to deal with it? 
a pessimistic picture was drawn regarding this issue. So Ms. Demi Ralp is writing what was generally discussed and what was the general consensus, consensus at Bilderberg this year. And she's saying basically that the attendees at this year's conference are quite pessimistic about the ability of the EU to to actually survive another economic crisis. She goes on to say it was noted that there has been a loss of credibility after the last financial crisis and thus it will be difficult to provide stability in an environment of distrust. It was also stated that Italy in particular is an important risk factor and you can find you can find a chunk of that quote in my Bulgaria Analytica article, not word for word, because I, I actually paid someone, I paid someone to translate it from Turkish to English, and the, my translated version is not identical to her translated version, but, but to me, it, it really stands out that according to Ms. Demiralp's account, that uh, the, attendees, the attendees at this year's Bilderberg are scared, basically, that if there's a new economic crisis in Europe, that the EU might not survive it. That something like this could possibly trigger the collapse of the EU. And she said, quote, a pessimistic picture was drawn regarding this issue. And in her article, she she discusses other issues with the EU. She's uh, talking about Granted, this is from the perspective of the participants as a whole, not her, per not her singular viewpoint, but she was talking about how it was stated that in order, uh, she was talking about uh, populism and nationalism being a threat to the EU, and like, uh, quote, comments and make a video about her thoughts and highlight the key points of her article. All right, you know what, I might, I might do a specific video about uh, Ms. Demiralp's Demir account, but at least for now, I I'm, I'm detailing in this long-form live stream. So she was also talking about problems such as trade wars, terrorism, climate change, and immigration were discussed as at Bilderberg as being threats to the EU and the existence of the EU. The future of Europe was the key topic on the list, and it was indeed discussed at this year's Bilderberg, but I am particularly highlighting her quote, or her uh, account, that it appears elites are very concerned that an economic crisis could trigger the utter collapse of the EU. I think that's enough for now with regard to the EU. Obviously, there's... there's <laughs> major, there should at least be major interest in what the Bilderberg Group and Bilderberg Conference participants have to say about the future of the EU. I'm getting a comment saying, please do videos specifically on her post quotes account, etc. Okay, um, if there's if there's that much demand for a video specifically on uh, Ms. Demi Ralp and her account of what happened at Bilderberg this year, I, I guess I better do one. I'm kind of overloaded at the moment, but I'll, I'll try to do one. And for those who are just tuning in now, I see the weaponization of social media i'll get to that some interesting news this week with regard to google um i'll get to that later on this stream but uh yeah for those of you who are just tuning in i see the audience is growing at the moment thank you very much for joining me if you go to bulgariaanalytica.org and you click on the main article on the site which is surprise bilderberg report reveals divided western elites United Against Turkey S-400 Deal. That is my article, which was published a couple days ago. And that article details Ms. Demi Ralp's account of what happened at Bilderberg this year. I'm going to comment, Google broke their data centers when they rolled out the weaponization. I'll, I'll be discussing Eric Schmidt and Google later on in this broadcast. Again, thank you very much for all the comments that are coming in. I'm going to try to address them. If you have questions, please please, please uh, put them in the chat. I'll try to address them as well. But now I'd like to get on to 
what to me was the biggest takeaway, or at least along with the concern about the future of the EU, to me what uh, I really found noteworthy and interesting from Ms. Demiralp's account of what happened at this year's Bilderberg conference is what she wrote about her native country, Turkey, and specific, excuse me, specifically what's going on right now with regard to Turkey, NATO, and Russia. So for those of you who are not familiar with the situation, Turkey is a long time NATO member, but things are getting a little dicey right now with regard to Turkey's status and potentially membership in the alliance. And uh, this is going, it's been going on for years under Prime Minister and now President Erdogan in Turkey. There's been a bit of a drift away from the West and away from NATO, albeit Turkey's still a member of NATO. But right now there's a hot button issue that could potentially be the unraveling of Turkey's membership in NATO. And, and that issue is Turkey's deal with Russia to purchase, I'm um, getting a comment, thanks for following the Bilderberg talk. Uh, yeah, there, Italy, I, I found the Italy, I was getting a comment about uh, uh, the economic situation in Italy being a concern to the Bilderbergers, I, I do find that interesting. Anyway, back to the S-400 issue. So Turkey has struck a deal with Russia to purchase the Russian S-400 missile defense system. This is basically Russia's prized um, uh, arms system and several countries have been expressing interest in and purchasing in recent years, but no one in NATO would dare do this with the exception of Turkey. And uh, the decision to buy this S-400 has enraged the US, it's enraged basically NATO as a whole. And now from Ms. Demiralp's account of the 2019 Bilderberg meeting, it appears that there is a consensus among Western elites that there is no forgiving Turkey for this S-400 deal. Uh, thank you for, if, if someone could post the Bulgaria Analytica article link in the comment stream, that would be perfect. Maybe someone just did, I'm not sure, but someone did just post the headline to the article. So uh, what Demi, Ms. Demiralp is saying is that among the Western elite, thank you very much for uh, Tupa Tip. <laughs> Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your username, but thank you very much for posting the article in the chat. So, Ms. Demi Ralp is saying that there's a consensus among elites at Bilderberg that not only is this uh, Turkey Turkish deal with Russia for the S 400 basically unforgivable, but there's a consensus that it will trigger sanctions most likely from the US but possibly uh, other countries will be involved in them and that likewise uh, Turkey will be cut out of the manufacturing process which it is currently involved in for the F-35 jets these are fighter jets these are American made fighter jets that Turkey is involved in producing through uh, Tur Turkey helps create some of the parts of the fighter jets and there's this whole program where Turkish pilots are involved and it was just after the Bilderberg meeting just this past week a couple of days ago more news breaking on that um, the US saying that Turkish pilots are going to be cut out of the the training process for the F-35s and that indeed Turk, uh, Turkey's gonna be cut out of the manufacturing process if the deal for the Russian S-400 goes through. And will it go through? Well, uh, Erdogan has been insisting for months that it is gonna go through and recent news out of Moscow is something along the lines that the S-400 is supposed to be delivered to Turkey in a matter of a couple months. And this is this has got the US 
enraged. There uh, are sanctions that are already drawn up that are going to take effect almost for sure if if the S-400 is actually delivered to Turkey. But I, I don't think prior to this report from Ms. Demi Raup about what happened in Bilderberg, I don't think it was clear that there was a consensus among NATO members or a consensus against, uh, among Western elites to take a hard-line approach with Turkey about the deal. But that's very much what Ms. Demi Raup's account suggests. And... To pull up the exact quote from the translation of the article that she sent to me, she says, um, and I've got it right now, uh, quote, it was noted, she's talking about what was discussed at Bilderberg, quote, it was noted that if Turkey insists on purchasing the S-400 missile defense system from Russia, there will be sanctions, that concessions will not be made to Ankara, and that Turkey will be removed from the F-35 consortium, and its role in the supply chain will be terminated. And those, those are pretty strong words. And in fact, she subheaded, the success, the, the, subheaded this section of her BBC article, uh, saying concessions will not be made to Turkey regarding S-400. And my translation of her Turkish, which I'll pull up in my my Bulgaria Analytica article, is that no compromise is going to be made. So to me, it's very noteworthy that there is a consensus among Western elites that the actions of Turkey within NATO with regard to its drift to Russia will not be tolerated and that there's going to be no compromising. So how do we read between the lines? Does this mean that Turkey's days in NATO are numbered? Well, we can't say that just yet, but, and for that matter, as I discussed in my Bulgaria Analytica article, it is still possible that Erdogan walks back this deal and completely walks away from it and the S-400 is never delivered to Turkey. That's not what Erdogan's saying is going to happen. He's insisting it will be delivered, but the U.S. is taking a very tough stance. It's obvious now, based on the, the report at Bilderberg, as well as everything that's been coming out of Washington, that sanctions are ready and that if this S-400 deal goes through completely, there will be sanctions on Turkey. And if that's the case, as I discussed in my Bulgaria Analytica article, Turkey is really in trouble economically. So the lira, the Turkish lira, has gone way down in recent years. And Turkey was recently in recession. Turkey's got all kinds of economic issues. So, the I mean, the sanctions are a major threat. Possibly Turkey... And walks back the deal and it doesn't happen. But uh, if if the S-400 deal goes through, if the, uh, the weapon system is delivered, possibly this is the beginning of the end of Turkey in NATO. We don't know. It's only speculation. But I also think that it's, it's very noteworthy that there is all this discussion about Turkey. This was not on the Bilderberg topics list, which some of you may not, uh, some of you may be aware of. Uh, I'm sure for those of you who follow Bilderberg, you're aware that the topics list is not a formal agenda and that it's been raised previously that the Bilderberg topics list does not always include some of the significant topics that are addressed at Bilderberg. You could argue that was the case this year with Turkey. So Turkey was not on the key topics list. However, Russia was. And this whole discussion with regard to Turkey very much relates to Russia. So maybe the argument from Bilderberg is this all falls under the umbrella of Russia. Or maybe they just don't want the public to know that Turkey was being discussed this year. But with regard to uh, also, what Ms. Ms. Demi Rolp noted is is that uh, I don't have it in front of me, but she was saying something about how it was influence in the region. And uh, I'm the comment: the U.S. was supposed to initially supply the F-35s to Turkey. Did they pull out? Uh, they are in the process of pulling out. Basically, what the U.S. is saying is that if 
this missile system from Russia is delivered to Turkey, then then Turkey is kicked out of the F-35 process. Uh, F-35 uh, manuf... Oh yeah, I forgot to note that. that the F-35, not only is Turkey involved in manufacturing the F-35, but Turkey purchases the F-35s and the U.S. is saying that the F-35s will not be delivered to Turkey if the Russian missile system is delivered to Turkey. And uh, one of the things I, I was also noting in my article that I found interesting was that, as I'm going to pull it up, um, the, the manufacturer, the primary manufacturer of the F-35 is Lockheed Martin. And interestingly, there's a retired U U.S. Navy admiral. His name is James O. Ellis. He attended Bilderberg this year, and he's actually on the board of Lockheed Martin. So you had high-level Trump administration people at Bilderberg this year, including Mike Pompeo, who was not on the participants list, as well as Jared Kushner. And uh, you've got all kinds of major people in the defense sector there, one of whom is James O'Ellis, who is a board member of Lockheed Martin, the manufacturer of these F-35s. So to me, the discussion on Turkey and Russia and the F-35s is, is very significant. And I was, I was about to delve a little bit how, into how Russia's influence in the region came up as a topic, and I believe Ms. Dimiralp was saying that it's, there's basically consensus that, that NATO and the West needs to counter Russia's influence in the region. And I don't think that just applies to Turkey. It probably applies to Eastern Europe and, and the Balkans as, as a whole. But it, it's something that's, that you could argue, yes, it falls under the Russia umbrella for a topic that was listed on the key topics list, but it's also something to show you how, side question, have you looked into QAnon? Uh, I, I don't really know anything about QAnon. I mean, yeah, I've briefly looked into, did anyone mention the USS Liberty? I, I don't believe so. Anyway, I was discussing how uh, Russia was on the key topics list, but it seems like a lot more was discussed than merely Russia. It was clearly discussed Russia's relations with NATO, Russia's relations with Turkey, and who knows, maybe Russia's relations with Eastern Europe as a whole and, and the Balkans, perchance. Uh, there weren't many participants from Eastern Europe there this year. The, there were at least a couple. One of them was the Estonian Prime Minister, who I believe is someone who is returning, or who had been to Bilderberg previously. But anyway, the point I'm here ma I'm making is that we get this key topics list, but as Charlie Skelton, the top Bilderberg correspondent nowadays, likes to say, they're just breadcrumbs. And maybe Russia really means Russia plus Turkey plus Eastern Europe. It's that uh, with regard to the participants list, which is also released, and I think I'm going to veer away from Ms. Demi Rolp's account now. If, if there's anything else you'd like me to touch on with regard to what Ms. Demi Rolp said, arguably spilling the beans about what was discussed at this year's Bilderberg. If you would like me to continue on with that, please leave a comment or a question. There there have already been comments saying, please do an entire video on that, but we're already almost a half hour in, so I want to get to some other uh, Bilderberg items. The participants list was interesting this year. As I've already noted, Mike Pompeo, U.S. Secretary of State, was not on the participants list, but he was indeed at the conference. Now, granted, when they drew up the participants list months ago, they probably had no idea that Pompeo was going to be on a European trip and passing through Switzerland at the time, but I don't think his name was ever added to the list, and I don't think Bilderberg ever made a public announcement that Mike Pompeo was indeed coming or that he was indeed there, and he was there for much of the day Saturday, if not more. Someone who was not there, who was on the participants list, who I did touch on in an entire video, uh, that was Annegret Crump karrenbauer also known as AKK, who's now a very prominent person in German politics. Crump karrenbauer is 
basically supposed to be the heir apparent to Merkel. She has taken over Merkel's old role as the leader of Germany's ruling party, and some people say that it's it's basically a shoe in that she's going to be the successor to Merkel as chancellor, although nowadays, especially with seeing some of the recent developments, that might not be the case. Well, anyway, Crump Karenbauer was on the participants list, and any time there's a rising star, uh, don't forget to look into the numerology they used in publishing the list. Uh, okay, send me, send me something about that later. Uh, yeah, any time there's a rising star or a presidential candidate or a potential candidate to become prime minister or chancellor, as was the case with Merkel, she attended before Bilderberg, slightly before she became Chancellor of Germany. So anytime there's someone like that attending, nowadays there's speculation that that person will soon become the next president or prime minister or chancellor. And I actually, with regard to some of my upcoming trips, I'm going to be touching on that with regard to Greece later. Well, so Crump Karenbauer was on the list, but she did not attend. And as I discussed in an interview I did with German journalist Max Bachmann at this year's Bilderberg, there is not a lot of clarity, but basically there was a reason given from the CDU, the Christian Democratic Union, the ruling party in Germany. And the, the party basically said that Crump Karenbauer was not attending because she had some important meeting to go to, I think, which was on the Sunday of Bilderberg. And Max was discussing this conversation with me, and that doesn't necessarily add up. Why would you skip such an important conference like Bilderberg, especially if you're in the position that Crump Karenbauer is in? However, over this week, more news surfaced, and uh, the leader of the SPD, the coalition partner of the CDU in Germany, resigned, and that's raised questions about whether the current coalition and current government in Germany can continue to exist or whether it might collapse and Merkel's rule could come to a come to an end early or some some uh, who, who knows what would happen and so I would say that the, that might be the reason what about Stacey Abrams is she a prime candidate all right I'll discuss say, Stacey Abrams uh, right now after I wrap up Crump Karenbauer so it appears that the coalition craziness in Germany and the in a sense, the collapse of the, the CDU, or at least the CDU's stranglehold over German politics, probably has to do with why Crump Karenbauer did not attend. And that's just a little update I wanted to throw in here. In fact, the, there were, uh, it was mentioned that there are other participants who were on the list who did not show. I'm not positive if that was the case. If someone wants to dig that up and include that in the chat, feel free to do so. But I found it very noteworthy that Pompeo attended but was not on the list and that Crump Karenbauer was on the list but did not attend. But I think now we have some understanding why she was not there. Does that mean she's not going to be the next chancellor of Germany? I don't know. There are internal politics that need to get sorted out in Germany. The Greens are on the rise, which actually relates to Bilderberg, but maybe I'll touch on that later. Uh, so Stacey Abrams. That was very interesting that, th tell you the truth, uh, I don't know. I don't know how serious her candidacy is. Right now, I, I believe she's still not a formal candidate. Uh, that is for President of the United States. In fact, maybe she goes for being Senator of Georgia as opposed to the President of the U.S. Uh, she's been going back and forth on that. I, I'm not sure if she's come out with anything definitive. I thought I'd read something saying she's not going to run, but she's... Uh, yeah, she, there's been a lot of talk about her running for uh, senator or running for president. Now, just because someone is a presidential candidate or potential presidential candidate and that person attends Bilderberg, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to become president or that they even have a strong candidacy. So last year, the governor of Colorado, Hickenlooper, I believe his first name is John, uh, Hickenlooper attended 
Bilderberg, and he indeed is a presidential candidate, and he's in the running, although it doesn't seem like his candidacy is so strong. But then again, it's early, and the way U.S. presidential politics works is it's not necessarily who's first out of the gate who ends up becoming the nominee of the Democrats or the Republicans. So I don't want to write him off, but last year Hickenlooper attended, and by no means does that mean he's going to go on to get the Democratic uh, nomination or or to become president. The, the Bilderberg group brings in politicians from various countries who sometimes are rising stars, sometimes are are just various politicians, just various members of parliament or congress or senate, and they like them for whatever reason, or maybe they want to give them some sort of audition. This was something I, I discussed in um, uh, a We Are Change report. Luke Radowski was interviewing me at uh, right outside the hotel just before the beginning of this year's conference, and I was talking about how for some of these politicians attending Bilderberg, it's an audition, and maybe they perform well at the audition, maybe they don't. Uh, Luke was discussing how how back in the day, uh, John Edwards basically performed very well at his Bilderberg audition and went on to become John Kerry's running mate. And I gave an example of a, a Bulgarian former European Union commissioner who was vying to become U, uh, UN Secretary General. I was discussing that with Luke and yeah, so some of these politicians, they, they come to Bilderberg and they network very effectively. They uh, they look for candidates that have something to hide so they can use as blackmail. Possibly. No, no so with Stacey Abrams, who knows? I mean, it she doesn't fit the profile of a very typical Bilderberg participant. But then again, Bilderberg brings in this eclectic group. And this year you had oil executives mixed in with various green people, green party members or or people with some company or ties to to the green movement and to environmentalism. So we don't know exactly what they see in these individuals and politicians who they invite. Some end up coming to Bilderberg repeatedly. Uh, some we never hear from again. Some are indeed presidential candidates or or politicians who go on to become president or prime minister or chancellor. So it's hard to tell. With with Stacey Abrams, we there haven't been any leaks. She was not very visible at this year's conference. Uh, I did find a photo, interestingly, of, of her pictured with Demi, uh, Demi Raup. Uh, I was just searching for uh, Demi Raup's English language version of the article, which I haven't found, but like I was mentioning before, she, Ms. Demi Rolp did send me the English translation, which I have in front of me, but I did, as I was searching for the English version, find a photo of Stacey Abrams with Ms. Demi Rolp. But Stacey Abrams never, as far as I'm aware, had any contact with the press outside conference. A lot of the participants, they go for runs, they go for walks. I don't think any of us reporters who were there this year ever saw Abrams going for a run or a walk outside the hotel. We did see her walking onto the boat, the, the builder boat, when they, they took a boat ride on Lake Geneva on Saturday evening of the conference and then dined in a castle along the shores of Lake Geneva. We saw Stacey Abrams then, but you know, we really have breadcrumbs or maybe not even breadcrumbs with regard to Stacey Abrams. Maybe something gets leaked in the future. Maybe Stacey Abrams ends up getting interviewed. Maybe Luke Radowski or someone ends up confronting her and we get a little information about her participation in this year's Bilderberg. But right now it's, it's hard to tell you, it's hard to really garner much of anything from Stacey Abrams' participation in Bilderberg this year. Maybe her her presidential bid, if it even happens, goes nowhere. So on Stacey Abrams, I don't have a whole lot to tell you. Maybe right now I'll jump ahead to Greece. And by the way, if there are other topics with regard to this year's Bilderberg conference you'd like for me to touch on, 
for instance, uh, by chance you're interested in the green movement and Bilderberg supposedly going green, uh, I could touch on that among some other issues, but I'm going to jump ahead to Greece since we're, we're on the topic of uh, presidential candidates or candidates to become prime minister appearing at Bilderberg. This is something no one is talking about right now. There is an election coming up in Greece next month. I believe it's on July 7th. The uh, Prime Minister of Greece, Alexis Tsipras, called SNAP a green movement equals communism. <laughs> right, um, so uh, Alexis Tsipras, the Prime Minister of Greece, called SNAP elections following his... Um, he didn't do so well in the European Parliament elections that took... A lot of peas took place recently. So there's a snap election coming up in Greece, and the opposition, the the main opposition party, New Democracy, which is basically the center right party in Greece, they're way up in the polls, or at least up. I've seen somewhere around like a nine, ten percent lead in the latest figures I've seen. New Democracy, if the polls are accurate, which obviously we know is not always the case, but New Democracy gaining over the past couple years and and uh Tsipras's far left now center left whatever you want to call them uh Syriza party they've been going down uh the issues remain in Greece so new democracy is the favorite to win the Greek parliamentary election next month now it just so happens that new democracy is headed by a man by the name of Kyriakis Mitsotakis. Mitsotakis comes from a very interesting family with Bilderberg ties. Uh, Mitsotakis' father was formerly the Prime Minister of Greece, and he attended Bilderberg, I believe, in the early 90s, and I believe he attend attended Bilderberg as Prime Minister. Uh, Mitsotakis, the the new one, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, the current head of Greece's New Democracy Party, he attended Bilderberg last year, 2018, and tour in Italy. He also attended Bilderberg in 2016 in Dresden, Germany. So this is already a multi-time multi -time Bilderberg participant. And if things go according to the polls and as expected, Mitsotakis, the young one, <laughs> will be the next prime minister of Greece. And if that's the case, that means yet another Bilderberg participant rising to the office of prime minister not too long after attending the Bilderberg conference. And I was touching on his family, I believe, uh, Kyriakos Mitsotakis has one or two sisters who have also attended Bilderberg. So this Mitsotakis family is, a, is becoming a bit of a Bilderberg dynasty. And if, as I said, if, if things go as expected, Kyriakos Mitsotakis will be the next prime minister of Greece. I'm going to try to make it to Athens for the Greek election next month. I can't guarantee that, but I'm already going to be in the region a week or two before then, so so I I think there's a decent chance I'm going to be there. If, if you are at all interested in coverage of the upcoming Greek parliamentary election, and there's definite reason to be interested in it other than Bilderberg, but I don't think anyone is covering the Bilderberg connection to this current Greek election. Uh, yeah, if you're if you're interested in coverage of the Greek election, please leave a comment or or mention it elsewhere, and maybe that will motivate me a little more to be there in Athens. I believe it's on July seventh. Before then, I will be in Istanbul if all things go according to plans, which isn't always the case with Turkey. But I've already booked my trip there. Uh, Turkey or rather Istanbul, has a very interesting election coming up later this month on June 23rd. There is going to be a redo of the Istanbul mayoral election. So there was a mayoral election in Istanbul earlier this year, along with other mayoral and regional elections that took place 
in Turkey. And anytime there's the mayoral election in Istanbul, it's very important in Turkish politics because basically in Turkish politics, he who controls Istanbul controls Turkey. And Erdogan and his AKP party have controlled Istanbul for the past quarter century. I think it's been exactly 25 years, something, something like that. And, oh, I'm getting a comment saying I'm breaking up. Um, if, if anyone else is, is seeing that I'm having connection issues or not coming through clearly, please leave a comment. I'm, I'm not getting anything from YouTube saying that's the case, but I'll, I'll keep an eye out for that. What? Oh, yes. Yes. Badly. I'm breaking up. Um, okay. Well, if, if, if that's the case, then I might have to wrap up the stream. No, no, I'm getting a no. All right, I guess there's disagreement over... All right, a couple people say no, I'm not breaking... All right, a few people are saying I'm fine. All right, it looks like I'm fine. So uh, hopefully that's the case. If I do see something from YouTube saying that my connection is breaking up, then, then I'll wrap it up. But yeah, so I'm planning on being in Istanbul on June 23rd when they have this redo election. The opposition, which is very much tied to Bilderberg, I will explain. The Turkish opposition narrowly won the Istanbul mayoral election. It was very, very close. The, the opposition narrowly defeated the AKP candidate who was Erdogan's former prime minister of Turkey. And there was a recount, and there was controversy, allegations from the AKP of voter fraud, but the, the opposition guy won. And it seemed like he was just going to go into office, and, and uh, to answer a prior question, now that I read your work, if this is a reflection of what to expect, your video report is much more enjoyable than... The ah, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I have been leaving it up to the audience a bit. Should I focus more on video coverage of Bilderberg, or should I focus more on written coverage of Bilderberg? If you'd like to chime in about the debate, be my guest. But anyway, back to Turkey. So uh, what happened was, is uh, Erdogan came out and said we need to have a redo of this election. And just a couple days later, the high election body in Turkey, based on some technicality, nullified the results of the Istanbul mayoral election. And now they're having a redo election on June 23rd. And I'm planning on be there, being there for that. Now, so what's the connection between video is great stuff? Please, okay, thank you. I mean, if, if you like video, I'll try to keep it coming. Uh, I mean, the truth is, I get paid to write. I report for various publications, but I, I don't get paid <laughs> to do YouTube. So sometimes it's a bit of a challenge for me to spend so much time on YouTube, but I, I'm going to try to keep it up. Uh, all right, so there's a definite Bilderberg connection with the Turkish opposition. And this is also something that, that doesn't get discussed a lot because... Most of the coverage, um, most of the coverage about Bilderberg, understandably, focuses on. Actually, I think my channel's demonetized, but that's another story. I'll, I'll get into another time. Someone's saying I could put ads on the video. Um, uh, most of the coverage about Bilderberg focuses on uh, participants and topics related to the U.S. and Western Europe. Understandably so, but as I have been covering from Ms. Demi Ralph's account of the article, and which is notable for several reasons. Turkey is very much a part of the Bilderberg Group. Turkey is part of NATO. It's part of the Transatlantic Alliance. It's part of what some elites like to refer to as the Euro-Atlantic world or community or Euro-Atlantic order. I find it funny that most news events related to Turkey, they, they like to publish in November. I'm curious why you say that, but uh, things do happen in Turkey in November. Don't forget Patreon, PayPal, etc. All right, I mean, if, if a lot of people appreciate my work, I may launch a Patreon, but I, I want to continue with what I'm talking about. So, yeah, Turkey is is an influential part of NATO, obviously, and Turkey is also influential within the Bilderberg Group. For instance, the Koch family, I believe I'm pronouncing that right, they're longtime Bilderberg members. Uh, there's one Koch billionaire 
who is very influential in Bilderberg, even though he almost never gets discussed. He's part of the steering committee. And in fact, Ms. Demi Ralp is a professor at the coach university in Istanbul. So uh, this coach family is very much involved in Bilderberg and frequently significant people, even with ties to Erdogan and even ministers or high, high ranking government officials come to Bilderberg uh, from Turkey, which is a bit odd nowadays because it really seems that Bilderberg is not fond of Erdogan, understandably so, and I think that's very clear based on what has been revealed in Ms. Demi Ralp's account of the 2019 conference. But So what I'm getting at is that the JHP, that's the, in English it's the CHP, they're known as the, the Republican Party. They are the main opposition party in Turkey. Their candidate won the first version of the Istanbul mayoral election, which has now been nullified, and now he's got to win it again, which could be even tougher uh, if the JHP is going to take over uh, Istanbul. Uh, but yeah, so the JHP is very much connected to Bilderberg, I would argue. Uh, two two notes on that matter from this year's Bilderberg. One, I did have one confrontation, ambush, interview, whatever you want to call it, with a, a Turkish a, a participant at this year's conference. And that was Metin Sip, who, as far as I'm aware, is not in politics. He's a robotics professor, probably at like the, the high, high levels of robotics worldwide. And uh, I would imagine he wasn't at Bilderberg this year for politics. But as is the case often in Turkey, people wear their politics on their sleeve. And for whatever reason, he was the only Turkish participant I could get to this year. And I'm running around with the camera asking him questions at the airport about Turkish politics. And I asked him what he thought about this Istanbul election. And he flat out said that, I hope we win again. So he was flat out openly acknowledging that he's part of the JHP or rooting for the JHP or that he supports the JHP, the Turkish opposition. On top of that, there was a Turkish opposition, JHP, uh, MP, who attended Bilderberg this year. In fact, it wasn't just any JHP member. It was the deputy chair of the party. His name is Unal Chevikos. Mr. Chevikos is very interesting, especially to what was discussed at this year's Bilderberg. Mr. Chevikos is a longtime Tur Turkish diplomat. He was formerly the ambassador to the UK. He formerly worked in Moscow. He's there. There's strong. Uh, he has a lot of ties to Turkey, Russia, and NATO, which apparently was a pretty significant topic at this year's. Bilderberg. I, I think Mr. Chevikos was involved in the drafting of the the Turkey, or excuse me, the Russia NATO Founding Act, and uh, he's very much been involved in relations between Turkey and Russia, and between NATO and Russia. And right now, he is the deputy chair of the main opposition party, and it's it's just blatantly clear that they're. There is a connection between the main opposition party, the JHP in Turkey, and Bilderberg. So maybe based on our prior discussion, you'd think, well, if, if Bilderberg supports the main opposition, then surely they're going to win this upcoming election in Istanbul and probably they'll, they'll rise to power. But things aren't so simple with Turkey. <laughs> things are always complex with Turkey, and uh, Erdogan has long held a grip, or at least for the most of the past decades, has basically held a grip on the country, and his AKP have held a grip on Turkish politics. Was anyone there from Saudi Arabia? No, this year, in fact, almost never is anyone there from Saudi Arabia, but last year, Saudi Arabia and Iran was a singular topic, or maybe there were two topics, I forget, but Saudi Arabia was on the key topics list last year, which I found interesting for a couple reasons that I discussed in my Bilderberg wrap-up from last year in Turin, Italy. If you're interested in that, uh, check out my coverage. It's on my YouTube channel from Turin last year. And my final video, I, I said something like, 
titled something like Curiosities and Questions for the Bilderberg Group. At some point, I discuss some Saudi Bilderberg ties. Um, but yeah, so on the one hand, you've got Bilderberg supporting the JHP, the opposition in Turkey. But on the other hand, Erdogan has had a stranglehold on Turkish politics. And I, I've, I've covered Turkey in depth over the past four years. I've been there for the the last three national elections plus the national referendum there in which Erdogan succeeded in transforming Turkey from a parliamentary system to a presidential system. So based on Erdogan's um, increasingly centralized system in Turkey, the, the move toward Russia slightly, uh, as I discussed in my Bulgaria Analytica article, there. <laughs> Turkey and Russia are not exactly best of friends, and that was something very interesting. The the uh, the conference this year took place where the Montreux Convention was signed back in 1936. If you're interested in Turkish-Russian relations, read read the end of my Bulgaria Analytica article where I explain the Montreux Convention and the significance of that. But yeah, so Erdogan has been very entrenched. Bilderberg supports the opposition. Maybe it's it's interesting to, to weigh who you know who's the more powerful force in geopolitics, B Bilderberg or Erdogan, and and that might play out with regard to Turkey's NATO membership. That might play out with regard to the S four hundred deal. That might play out with regard to the Istanbul election. Although I wouldn't bet on Bilderberg uh, deciding the outcome of the Istanbul election. I would not be surprised. Uh, I, want, I mean, I want to stay fairly impartial here, but I think there's a lot of suspicion that there's chance for various vote rigging with this upcoming... Uh, someone's giving a comment, say they ba play both sides. You know, that's very interesting, especially with with on the one with the, all the different green people there this year. Yeah, B Bilderberg is very successful at playing both sides. And in fact, you know what? With... With regard to Bilderberg's support and connections to the JHP, part of it could be they just might be waiting for Erdogan's regime and his power to collapse and it relates to the discussions this year. If the S-400 deal goes through, if sanctions hit Turkey, maybe the economy is the undoing of Erdogan's power in Turkey. Just as elites are concerned that the economy Economy might be the undoing of the EU, as they apparently uh, noted at this year's Bilderberg. So, so yeah, I think it's interesting to follow events that have ties to Bilderberg as they play out throughout the year. And that's something that I'm going to try to do, especially if that's of interest to you. As I was saying, a lot of the people who cover Bilderberg, not all, but a lot of them, they're focused on I mean, it goes for the general audience as well. It just completely falls off. But next month, a multi-time Bilderberg participant might become Prime Minister of Greece. There's this interesting election coming up in Turkey later this month, which I expect to be there for. And Turkey's obviously very much of interest to the Bilderberg group. So I'm going to try to make an effort to discuss... Some world events, as I cover them throughout the year, as they relate to Bilderberg. And I guess I might as well mention that even before I travel to Turkey, next on my itinerary is the Western Balkans, which is, eh, it's the Bilderberg group, I don't think, takes so much interest in the Balkans. Although, as I've reported on previously, there, there are people who get invited. For instance, last year, the Prime Minister of Serbia, which is the country that I will next be in, I'm going to Serbia this week, uh, the Prime Minister of Serbia was invited last year. In fact, she was the one who initially leaked, or at least her office did, leaked the location and date of the meeting. And then I later confirmed that by audio recording her at an EU event last year, confirming that it was indeed going to be in turn Italy. Well, anyway, uh, last year the Serbian Prime Minister attended Bilderberg. This year there was a Bulgarian man who was there. I've touched on another Bulgarian who was there previously, and it came up this year that Nate, it wasn't on the agenda, but Russia's influence in the region <clears throat> is of concern to the Bilderberg group. So perchance Bilderberg is 
discussing the Balkans. The Balkans very much relates to Turkey and Russia as uh, what U.S. influence has declined in the Balkans over the past decade and Russian influence has been on the rise, Turkish influence as well. So maybe the Bilderberg Group is discussing uh, various world powers that are vying for influence in the Balkans. Maybe not, but I'm heading to the Balkans this week, and I spend a lot of time in the Balkans in general, so um, maybe I'll, I'll touch on some Balkan affairs as they relate to Bilderberg. If there are any other Bilderberg 2019 topics that you would like me to discuss in this video, please chime in right now because we're now one hour in, and I wasn't really planning on going more than an hour, although I, I could continue on briefly, but I, I think I am going to wrap it up very shortly. I have given you a bit of a preview of my upcoming travels, especially as they relate to Bilderberg. If you want me to continue throughout the year, as I cover geopolitics, to touch on how some geopolitical issues have connections to Bilderberg, uh, chime in with comments about that. And if, if I gauge that there's interest, or maybe even if I don't gauge there is interest, I will, over the course of the year, come back to Bilderberg now and then as it relates to geopolitical matters that I'm covering. So for those who might not have been here at the beginning during this broadcast, I covered how there has been, in a sense, a leak, although under under the Bilderberg's uh, rules, which are uh, Chatham House rule, I believe that Ms. Demi Ralp, who wrote the account of what happened at this year's meeting, I believe she's allowed to do that under their own rules, just not cite uh, what information came from whom and not to attribute any individual. I think she's allowed to do what she did, but in general, it never happens. And uh, would you mind do a project together with me? Something like a comfortable friend interview? Just email me. You can find my email on my uh, somewhere on my YouTube channel. Actually, it's joshfriedman11 at gmail.com. Just, just interview me. Um, where was I? Yeah, so I, I, in this video I discussed on uh, Turkish academic and economist Selva Demi Ralps uh, a little bit of an expose on what happened at this year's Bilderberg. I personally found it very noteworthy that Bilderberg members and participants are worried that a new economic crisis could trigger the collapse of the EU. I also found it noteworthy that despite not being on the key topics list, Bilderberg had multiple debates or discussions about Turkey, particularly as it relates to Russia and NATO and the S-400 deal with Russia, which could trigger sanctions from the U.S. and get cause things to really get ugly between the U.S. and Turkey and possibly ugly with regard to the Turkish economy. And I previewed some of my upcoming travels. If there's anything else you'd like me to cover, Please chime in right now. I kind of skipped over the green part, but I, I did find it interesting that there seems to be an increasing emphasis placed by the Bilderberg Groupment move. Excuse me, Bilderberg Group on the green movement, and that's reflected in the participants. It's reflected in some of the conversations limited conversations that the participants are having with reporters on the outside, including myself. And, and uh, I think it's reflected in other matters, such as a tweet <laughs> coming from Eric Schmidt. Ah, Google, I forgot about that. I got to touch on that right now. Then, then I'll wrap things up. So social media and Google. Uh, this year, social media was on the Bilderberg uh, list. Please keep us abreast. Uh, yeah, uh, social, the quote, weaponization of social media was on the Bilderberg topics list. Some people read into that and decided, well, that means social media censorship. I, I can't make that leap. There haven't been any leaks thus far or any discussions that have indicated that clearly Bilderberg has come out in support or was discussing social media censorship, although it wouldn't surprise me, but I haven't seen any proof of that. Uh, but there were some interesting, there were some interesting uh, conversations, brief, very brief, if at all, with Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, on the outside. And 
I was the only one, actually, who raised the James Damore memo with him, so he didn't respond to that, but I, I tried screaming out a question multiple times to Eric Schmidt, and as he was getting into a car right in front of me, uh, could I get a comment about the James Damore memo, or the Google memo, as it's called? Uh, for those of you who are not aware, James Damore was an employee of Google. He authored this internal memo that eventually leaked, discussing how <laughs> diversity at Google, what happens to PFT right after, seems related. Uh, yeah, uh, Dan Dix uh, had his Press for Truth channel demonetized right after Bilderberg. In my estimation, it probably doesn't tied directly to Bilderberg. However, it, it's very interesting that Dan Dix was questioning Eric Schmidt, the former head of Google, which owns YouTube, about <laughs> censorship of conservatives on social media, and then just days later, his channel is demonetized. Actually, if, if I were to guess, it, I think... Dan, this is just a complete guess, complete speculation. Dan Dick's demonetization might have something to do with some of the social, socially conservative views. Uh, I meant personally, not, not the Vox thing. Uh, uh, I think Dan Dick's uh, demonetization does relate to the Vox thing. But um, it was interesting that one of his videos was taken down too. I, I believe... He had a, a video discussing pedophiles that was taken down. And if I were to read between the lines a bit, I think some of the content that's on the Press for Truth channel that espouses some socially conservative views or just questions social justice warrior, um, I don't know, ideology, uh, that might have been targeted and it appears it was targeted with this one pedophile view. So I can't make the leap saying that Dan Dix questioned uh, Eric Schmidt and a few days later he was demonetized. I can't say that the two are correlated. I don't have any proof of that. And Dan Dix was caught up in this whole Vox adpocalypse thing. But it's very much noteworthy that social media was on the topics list, the key topics list at Bilderberg this year. Eric Schmidt, the leap I say was Vox is related to Bilderberg. I can't make that leap. I don't have any proof of that. Um, social media was on the topics list. Eric Schmidt is a Bilderberg steering committee member. He is also someone who is starting to get recognized as a person very influential in Bilderberg. Eric Schmidt might be the Bilderberg member who has the closest, uh, maybe I shouldn't say closest ties, but um, Charlie Skelton in his articles and in conversation with him, some of which I'm going to publish, by the way, in an upcoming podcast that hopefully I release tomorrow. I did an hour long podcast with Charlie Skelton. You might find that very interesting. And we discussed what I'm about to tell you. So Charlie Skelton's been saying that Eric Schmidt is in a sense the heir apparent within Bilderberg to Henry Kissinger. And at least right now, Henry Kissinger is the most prolific and most prominent member of the Bilderberg group. And Eric Schmidt, if he indeed, it, you need to say what they do, code your messages so YouTube doesn't pick it up. Yeah, I mean, YouTube's picking up all kinds of stuff, but uh, that's another story. Um, related, though. But yeah, Eric Schmidt, nonetheless, very powerful person in Bilderberg. And I tried asking him about the James Damore memo. For those of you who are not aware, James Damore was, like I just said, he, he was conservative, who spoke out about the uh, bias against conservatives and whites at Google, within Google, and that turned into a lawsuit, and there's news about the lawsuit just this week, days after Bilderberg, there's news that Google's attempt to get the lawsuit thrown out of court failed. Yes, watch your words, man. <laughs> I'll try to watch my words, or maybe I won't. Who knows what will happen? I, I need to back up my videos on, on BitChute or something else. 
Uh, but yeah, so the, the, the case against Google, Google tried to get it thrown out of court. This week there was a ruling against Google uh, that case, the lawsuit, is not getting thrown out of court. And rather, it's moving on to discovery, and maybe out of the discovery process, there will be some uh, new revelations about Google's alleged bias against conservative, against white people, etc. Well, Dan Dix and I and others tried asking Eric Schmidt about that this week, and we basically got nothing out of him. He cursed at Luke Radowski. Um, but I asked him specifically about the James Damore memo. He did not respond. But yeah, it was very interesting that just a few days after this incident at Bilderberg, this VOD, Vox adpocalypse happens, Press for Truth gets hit in it. Um, likewise, uh, right around that time, there's the, the revelation, or there's the, the court ruling against Google. So major developments with regard to Google, YouTube, social media censorship, alleged bias against conservatives, all coming out just days after Bilderberg. And that's one of the reasons why I like to continue on with my Bilderberg conference, co conference coverage for days or maybe in the future, maybe even this year, possibly weeks after the conference ends, because there might be leaks, there might be something like Demiralp writing an account of what happened in Bilderberg and it gets completely glossed over and I don't want to be glossing over that. And likewise, with regard to Google and YouTube and social media censorship and the lawsuit, there's flat out news breaking days after the conference that you would think has soft or strong ties to what is discussed at Bilderberg. So that's that's more reason for me to continue on with my Bilderberg coverage. I hope now we're 72 minutes into this video. Someone's saying uh, th thank you for the compliments. It's it's really my pleasure to to cover the com by the way, do you think depopulation especially for dumb down Americans is on the agenda? Um not on the formal agenda. And that's putting things a bit harshly. However, I think there have been leaks in the past discussing concerns with regard to, I mean, I mean, the Bilderberg conference participants discussing concerns with regard to population, population growth, and possibly support of depopulation. And you might be able to find some leaked documents pertaining to those topics. But yeah, um, so... Here we are, we're a week after the conference. I hope this video, coupled with the podcast that I'm gonna release, it's an hour long, in-depth podcast with Charlie Skelton. We're on a boat on Lake Geneva, passing, uh, you're welcome for addressing your question. We're passing by the Bilderberg Hotel, um, discussing a lot of things in depth with regard to Bilderberg, the next gen of Jim Tucker. Actually, that's something that I've been having private discussions about. Part of the reason why I weigh, should I focus on video coverage? Should I focus on written coverage? Part of what I'm getting at isn't merely is video more important or is written more important, but is short form, short form, hard hitting content, or maybe short form eye-popping content more important? Or is long form investigative work that requires a, le a lot of legwork more important? And I have background in investigative journalism and I'm, I'm, I'm used to working on stories that take months of investigation, research, takes cultivating sources, takes being patient, uh, letting things play out over the long term, and maybe I could be of more service to you with more long form, form investigative work, cultivating, attempting to cultivate sources within Bilderberg, and, and that's what Jim Tucker, as far as I'm aware, was was great at. Long is best, but of short edits and also long. Yeah, I mean, chime in with your, with your feedback on that matter. I, I don't have an answer, but to me, Jim Tucker is really missed, and it doesn't seem like we have a whole lot in the way of 
investigative coverage of Bilderberg. We've got a lot of people with uh, YouTube videos. We've got a lot of we've got we've got confrontations. We have Charlie Skelton doing incredible work documenting who's there, what are their connections, uh, what's the bigger picture. If there is a bigger picture, that's something I delved into with Charlie on our on our podcast that hopefully will come out tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, I think it'd be nice if we had someone who's got sources on the inside and on a yearly basis is is delivering some investigative coverage of Bilderberg. Maybe that's the direction I go. Maybe not. We'll see. Uh, we're 75 minutes in. Anyone else want to chime in with any questions or comments? Otherwise, I think I've been going long enough. I think we can wrap it up. Josh, take care and best regards from NYC. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who's been watching. I'm very grateful for your feedback, for your engagement. This is something I truly enjoy covering. So if if I can find something uh, to focus a lot of coverage on that there's also a lot of interest in, which isn't always the case for me, then I'm a happy man. Something hopefully bigger will come of it. Uh, yeah, we're 76 minutes in. Let's let's wrap this up. Okay, thank you, thank you once again to everyone who watched, to everyone uh, who's going to watch or is watching the replay. Thank you very much for all the engagement. Ted, comment, have you been uh, upload being with Sloan? If you're in work, why do you guys stand the shot back from the cold connections? Well, such an hour. Look, honestly, I, I know very, very little about the occult. I find it interesting. Maybe one day I'll, I'll do some research into it. I've done a tiny, tiny bit of research, but, but right now I focus on what I can report on, what I find interesting, what I think has major geopolitical significance. Um, well, time flies. Thank you for the report. Yeah, I mean... There we go. I think Bilderberg is a topic that's of importance to you that I find to be of geopolitical significance and something that I like covering and I get a lot of enjoyment and satisfaction out of uh, working my butt off to cover it and bring some uh, information about it to you. So with that, I think that's enough. Uh, also comment below, I have four days worth of vlogs I have a day one Bilderberg vlog, day two Bilderberg vlog, three and four this year. Um, I mean, the f I have footage of it. I could publish it if you want. If if you don't care so much, leave a comment below also, because I don't want to take the time to put that all out there. But for sure, my in-depth podcast with Charlie Skelton is coming out. Let me know if you want those vlogs, or if you don't want those vlogs, I could release them at any time, basically. But yeah. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this to you. I hope I'm of value to you. And from Switzerland, that's a wrap. And I hope to be coming to you. And I hope you will be uh, tuning in as I'm reporting from various places all around the world. Next up, as I mentioned, the Balkans, then hopefully Turkey, possibly Greece. And yeah, I really enjoyed this. So thank you very much. And I'm putting an end to this live stream right now. Uh, au revoir and choose from Switzerland.